today I want to talk to two groups of people. Uh, one would be the backslider who knew the Lord, was truly born again, knows what it's like to belong to God, is off in sin and in this world and just feels like there's no hope, no way back. But deep down in their heart, they want to come back. And the other person I want to talk to is the person who has come back, who has repented, who has turned from their idolatry, from the pursuit of this world, things of this world. But yet, they don't have comfort and peace that they've been accepted back by the Father yet, and they don't know what's wrong. So it's these two people I want to talk to today. So let's pray. Father, I ask today that the Lord Jesus Christ will be made known to us, your grace and your mercy. And Lord Jesus, how you came and went to that cross for the sole reason of making reconciliation not only possible between us and the Heavenly Father, but that you yourself and you, our Father, arrange and call and choose and direct and bring us to you. We have nothing to offer you. We have nothing we can do for you. but your mercy, your gracious mercy that we hope in today. So let's start off Hosea chapter 14 verse 4. And this, is, this is what God's saying to the children of Israel. I will heal their backslidings. I will love them freely. For my anger is turned away from them. For the child of God, that person who is truly born again, and they know what it was like to walk with God and our Lord Jesus Christ, and yet for some reason, they turned back and went their own way. It's what the Bible refers to as backsliding. They eventually become the most, becomes the most miserable state, most miserable life for that person. And that's, that, that was me, if you've listened to my testimony, a video, you know that was me. I've talked about this many times. Now this misery for the backslider may come quickly or it may take many years. For those whose backslidings uh, uh, have been for many years like mine was, I'm guessing that there were periods of time where there has been repentance and renewal with the Lord only to once again backslide. That's my story anyway. I was like the, the description of the perpetual backslider in Hosea. Let's look at this. Hosea 4, chapter 4, verse 16. This is God talking to Israel again. For Israel slides back like a backsliding heifer. <laughs> that was me. The true backslider has a longing to be with God, to walk in obedience, and to belong to God. Now, the reason for this is because they were born again. They were truly born again. At one, and uh, that has not changed. God has created a new person and a new spirit in them. It is this new person, this new spirit, this new creation that belongs and longs to be with the Father. However, when a person turns back, they become a slave. They become a slave to sin. They are ruled over by the powers of darkness once again. This is the picture of people who belong to God and turn back to their own ways. Uh, this throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelations. One book that does the job best, in my opinion, of showing this is the book of Judges. The people of Israel, God's chosen now, would serve God for a while, and they drift away, become morally bankrupt and corrupt before the Lord. God would extend a window of opportunity for them to repent and return, but they would not. So he would give them over their, to their enemies. And they would serve their enemies. And they would groan under the pressure and the slavery until the point they would cry out to God for deliverance. Ultimately, they would repent, 
get rid of their idols and submit to God and God would raise up a deliverer for them and for a while things were good again. And then they would drift away and start doing what was right in their own eyes again. Inevitably, they would become more corrupt than they were before they repented and returned. This is the story of Israel throughout the Old Testament. This is the story of many a back, true backslider today. What is amazing about the story of Israel and their backslidings is how God dealt with them and what God's desire was concerning their backslidings. It's nothing new under the sun. God has not changed. His call then and now is to repent and to return to Him. For the true backslider, that new creation in them wants nothing more than to do this. This is the way of God concerning His people who seek out their own way. This is the clear message of the entirety of the Bible. The message is to repent and return. Now let's look at the first opportunity. The window opens for an opportunity to repent. I'm still thinking of children of Israel here. In Judges and for our lives. Now, this first window of opportunity to repent, God's calling, convicting, Spirit's convicting, your conscience is shouting at you. And this is the easy way to repent and return. You know, maybe things won't be so bad. Maybe there will be reper repercussions for our actions. Nonetheless, at this point, early in the backsliding, if a person repents, they have a bright future in the Lord. I'm not talking about a future of worldly gain, but rather an unveiling of God, Jesus, and their goodness and glory, and so, so much more. A person can repent, put it behind them, and go on to know the Lord as He reveals Himself to them, and become a useful person in God's kingdom, and enjoy a rich life in the kingdom of God. Again, the riches are not of this world, but rather they are the riches of Christ. Now, there's another option. It's the way I chose. If a, God, a child of God chooses the hard way, then what comes next is not pretty. You know, a backslider may get this world's goods, at least for some time. They may get all their heart's desires. But what eventually happens is God lets the enemy come in and take dominion of that person. The fleshly appetites of that person get out of control, and they start to self-destruct. This is what the Bible refers to as letting the backslider become filled with their ways. Look at this, Proverbs 14, 14. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways. While things may have started off good for the backslider, maybe things were enjoyable, fun, finally getting all this stuff, whatever it may be, they soon find that nothing they do can satisfy them. In the pursuit of the lust of the flesh, they may not be getting everything they want, or they may be getting everything they want. I know in my case, God allowed me to fill up with the vanity and desires of my evil heart to the point where everywhere I looked at what I was pursuing and getting for myself was all vain. The new creation, the new spirit God created in me way back when I got born again. In my sober moments would scream at me, vain, vain, vain. All is vanity. For other backsliders, getting filled with their own ways may have brought on a faster destruction, such as what addiction and or disease will do to a person. And other, you know, that's just a couple of examples, there's more. But anyhow, at this point, a person, a backslider, is a slave to sin once again. This person's under the taskmasters of the powers of darkness, and there's nothing they can do about it anymore. This person's in prison or in a dungeon. Destruction and misery are everywhere they look. They can do nothing to get out of the hole they got themselves into. The only thing they seem capable of doing is digging that hole even deeper, and it gets a whole lot darker. Regardless of the road traveled in backsliding, the point is, is that we harden our hearts and we stiffen our necks 
against the gentle call of the Spirit to repent and return. So God has the enemy come in like a flood. And on top of that, we have a harvest from the crop of sin we have sown that we will have to deal with. If I were to describe how bad I was in my backslidings, I can give you a story out of the Bible that describes the way I was to a T. This is the story of Ohola and Aholabah. You can find the story in Ezekiel 23. This story is harsh and it's also disgusting. I want to let you know that up front. So let's get into the story of Ohola and Aholabah. Ohola and Aholabah were names that God had given to his people. Look at this, Ezekiel 23, 4. Ahola was the name of the elder, and Aholabah the name of her sister. They became mine, and they bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Ahola is Samaria, and Aholabah is Jerusalem. Now, Ahola was the name that God gave to the northern ten tribes of Israel. Samaria was their capital. And Aholabah was the name he gave Judah and Benjamin, the southern two tribes. And Jerusalem was their capital. If you do not know the story of how Israel split and the backslidings and apostasy they both went into, this story may not make sense. But I will try to make some sense of it, sense out of it with God's help. After King Solomon died and his son became king, God split the nation of Israel in two because of Solomon's wickedness and turning away from the Lord to pursue women and participating in the idolatry that his non-Jewish wives practice. And as a side note, this is a good clue for us to heed the warnings of the New Testament to not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever in our relationships. This is what happened. God ripped the kingdom in half because Solomon pursued women and got tangled up in their sins, their idolatry. Anyhow, when the nation was split, the northern ten tribes almost immediately forsook God and fell into deep idolatry and became utterly corrupt before the Lord. They made it their life's passion to pursue the lust of the flesh and idolatry, and well, they were just plain evil. Ahab being one of the most notorious names, the evil king of uh, Israel, if you've heard of him, that's just evil. God tried and tried to get them to repent. There's two famous prophets were used over and over to call them back to get them to repent. You, you may know their names. Elijah and Elisha. And there were others as well. God's call to them was to repent and return. Instead of doing that, they were morally bankrupt before the Lord. Here is their story in Ezekiel from God's perspective. This is what God has to say about Ahola, this is the northern ten tribes. And Ahola played the harlot when she was mine, and she doted on her lovers, on the Assyrians, her neighbors, which were clothed in blue, captains and rulers, all of them desirable young men, horsemen riding upon horses. Thus she committed her whoredoms with them, with all them that were the chosen men of Assyria, and with all on whom she doted, with all their idols, she defiled herself. Neither left she her whoredoms brought out from Egypt. For in her youth they lay with her, and they bruised her breast of her virginity, and poured out their whoredoms upon her. Wherefore I have delivered them into the hands of her lovers, and to the hands of hand of the Assyrians upon whom she doted. Now how is this passage applicable to a backslider? Well, a backslider ultimately turns to this world and seeks out this world's pleasures. That is the picture of the Assyrians here. They are the world. The world has a lot of idolatry to offer. And the people of God, Israel, a whole lot here, people of God, Set up idols in their hearts, the idols of the Assyrians, the idols of the world. Whatever, listen, whatever you devote your time to, wherever your treasure is, there is your heart. That is your idol. That is what happened here with Hola. 
Now, the people are not just playing the whore spiritually. Idolatry is uh, one thing God's referring to here. But if you read the scriptures, you know it is often literal whoredom too. Regardless, the book of James specifically describes whoredom as being a lover of this world and the things of this world. The world and the lust of the flesh is what the backslider pursues, just like everybody else. That is Ahola, northern ten tribes, corrupt and destitute, morally bankrupt before God. Eventually, God gave them over to their enemy, the Assyrians, because they did not repent. The true backslider... I keep saying true backslider. I'm talking about the one who was born again. Because there's a lot who have named the name of Christ in church, prayed a little sinner's prayer, and never got born again. I'm not talking about them people. I'm talking about those of you who knew you were changed on the inside. So when I say true backslider, someone who knew God at one time walked with God. So the true backslider that hardens their heart will eventually be given over to the dominion of the enemy of their soul. God will do this. And even this world will turn on them. Now, as if that was not bad enough, let's look at Judah, Benjamin, the southern two tribes. This is where I found myself. Ahola, bad, 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 Ahola. Very bad, what they did. But watch what Ahola does. Believe me when I say... The description Judah or God gave Judah is disgusting. It's actually disgusting is an understatement. But Ahola wasn't bad enough for Judah's liking. They went further in, depra in their depravity than Ahola. Just like Judah, my corruption, my moral decay knew no boundaries. Let's look at Ahola. Let's look at what God has to say. Again, remember this is the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, that God's talking about here. Ezekiel 23.11 Now, although her sister, Aholabah, saw this, saw what was going on with Ahola, saw what they did, saw what God turned them over to Syria, she became more corrupt in her lust than she, than Ahola, and in her harlotry became more corrupt than her sister's Ahola. Harlotry. Aholabah saw Ahola, and what... The, Ahola had done and, and how God has dealt with him, but yet they went further in their wickedness than Ahola. The perversion that uh, Judah participated in, the way this God describes her, is enough to shock most people. But not Aholaba, she couldn't be shocked. She delighted in her perversions. This, in a nutshell, is why I say Aholaba was who my backslidings are patterned after. I couldn't be shocked. I could. I was delighted in my perversions. The perversions I participated in can be described in no other way than just plain disgusting. I'm not going to go into detail about that part of my life because it's so shameful, but I'll let God describe it for you from His Word. Let's finish reading about a whole here in Ezekiel 23, 12, verse 12 through verse 21. She, that's a whole about, Lusted for the neighboring Assyrians, captains and rulers, clothed most gorgeously, horsemen riding on horses, all of them desirable young men. Then I saw she was defiled. Both took the same way, but she increased her harlotry. She looked at men portrayed on the walls, images of the Chaldeans, those are the Babylonians, portrayed in vermilion, that's a painting stuff, girded with belts around their waists, flowing turbans on their heads, all of them looking like captains, in the matter of the Babylonians of Chaldea, the land of their nativity. As soon as her eyes saw them, she lusted for them and sent messages to them in Chaldea. When the Babylonians came to her and to her bed of love, they defiled her with their immorality. So she was defiled by them and alienated herself from them. She revealed her harlotry and uncovered her nakedness. And then I alienated, God's talking about here, myself from her. As I had alienated myself from her sister. Yet, she multiplied her harlotry and called into remembrance the days of her youth. When she had played the harlot in the land of Egypt. There's a whole ball doing the same thing a whole did in the land of Egypt. For she lusted for her paramours. 
It's an old word for her lovers. Whose flesh is like the flesh of donkeys. Whose issues is like the issue of horses. Thus you call the remembrance the lewdness of your youth when the Egyptians pressed on your bosom because of your youthful breasts. Now, if any of you have ever been involved in pornography and acted out some of the pornographic stuff you've witnessed in your bedroom, then you know exactly what God's describing here, especially in verse 20. The bottom line, the bottom line here is Ahola, the northern ten tribes, Ahola, was a whore, but a holaba was a pervert. Judah, Benjamin, pervert. So why did God consider the northern ten tribes to be a whore? But he considered Judah and Benjamin, the southern two tribes, to not be just a whore, but a pervert too. Now if you've ever read First and Second uh, First and Second Kings or First and Second Chronicles or both, the answer is there. The northern ten tribes Right after God split the kingdom, took the ten tribes out of Solomon's kingdom, they backslid. I mean, it was almost immediately. They never repented. They never looked back. However, so that's Ahola, never looked back. However, Judah, Aholoa, they were perpetual backsliders, like the backsliding heifer that Hosea describes. Both of them remembered their lust, just like the lust the children of Israel had when they were slaves in Egypt back in Moses' days. And this reference to Egypt is very interesting. God is referring to a time, listen to this, before the first Passover lamb was slaughtered, slaughtered, just before the exodus of Israel under Moses. And we know that Passover lamb, uh, lamb Paul says, was Christ. It's a type of Christ. So what God is saying here is they went back to how they were before they were saved by the blood of the Passover lamb. Does this sound familiar? Judah would backslide, then repent and walk with God for a while. Then backslide, then repent and walk with God for a while. This happened over and over again. What's interesting and those of you who have done this very thing or are doing it now know this to be true, is each time they backslid, they slipped into more depravity than the time before. This is a phenomenon that happens with those who have been born again and backslide. And the reason is because God allows the backslider to fill up with their ways. And the flesh... Our carnal desires have no boundaries and no limits, and our flesh under the influence of the demonic is a slave driver. A backslider walks in the lust of their flesh, and at the same time they're chained to the powers of darkness, so that perversion and destruction is the only path, the only outcome. If God does not intervene, that person is a hopeless case. Judah, Benjamin, considered a pervert because they per backslid over and over and over again. It wasn't a one-time thing like Israel. And it got worse and worse and worse. More and more crossing the line. More and more going over the boundaries. And, and let's look at their thinking because I can remember thinking about this scripture I'm about to bring up uh, while in a backslidden state. Uh, during some sober times, it is a description of total hopelessness and bondage to sin. This is in Jeremiah, chapter 18, verse 11. Uh, 11c, the end part of the verse, and verse 12. The Lord's talking. Now return everyone from his evil ways, and make your ways and doings good. And they said, that is hopeless, so we will walk according to our own plans, and will everyone obey the dictates of his evil heart. Now, here's what God was saying. Return and quit doing evil. And this is their response. This is hopeless. I can't. There is no way for me to turn around. I'm stuck in my sins and idolatry and worldliness. It's just the way it is. This is the picture of someone who has no control over the issues coming out of their heart nor any control over the pursuits that are the result of those issues. 
Now, I want you to think about this. God's not describing a person who does not belong to him. These are his people he's describing. And I can so vividly remember recalling this verse and saying, that's me. It's hopeless. I can't change. It's hopeless. I remember those days. So a true backslider can come to the point that even though they desire to belong to God again, there is a hopelessness that they are bound forever to live in sin, and at some point they fear being eternally separated from God. This can and does create anxiety in them. They sigh and groan and breathe a whisper to God that they wish it were not so. That is all the strength they have is to whisper that prayer and sigh because they have no hope of ever being restored. They know they are either a whore or a pervert or both in God's eyes. This whoredom and perversion is not always sexual. It's worldliness too. Though they may not know that is how God would describe their backsliding ways, when they hear this, they can only say, true of me. So true. Now I know this is harsh. And I am only describing how God dealt with me and the truths he showed me, even in my backslidden state and afterwards. A true backslider may deafen their ears to this message at first. But the one sighing and groaning is hearing it or will hear it. And they are or will get in agreement with God about their lives. This is amazing. Listen to this. This is amazing. That while in our backslidden state, God is still talking to us. That's just this kind of stuff that's coming up in my mind that I'm reading to you. While I'm backslidden. Though harsh as it is, in fact, he is still the fact that he is still talking to us should inspire some hope. Now, be honest, I'm being honest here. I'm looking back and I can see he did not let me go during all that time, but while I was in the middle of it all. These verses are coming to mind. And uh, the occasions on my sober moments, his word would come in and it would haunt me. It wouldn't give me hope. I wouldn't get in hope from a message like this. It was all fear and dread. But I can see now that God had not let me go. Now listen to this. Or he would have never bothered to tell me any of this stuff to start with. And all I can say is great and merciful are you, Father, to let your word be the hammer that we need to break up our hearts and allow us to hear your words of life. Now that we've heard the thunder of God and maybe even seen a little lightning, we can't leave the story here. Keep in mind, all the time God's revealing how he felt and how he saw his people, he was also calling them to repent and return and be restored. This is the Father's heart. It's reconciliation. His message was and is, Return to me and I will heal your backslidings. So let's turn to the one who said this. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. Let's see what Jesus said. He says, Come unto me, all you who are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This is the Father's heart, and it is found in Jesus Christ. He says, Come unto me. I am gentle, and you will find rest. Submit yourselves to me, and you will find my yoke is easy, and nothing like the yoke of this world that's wrapped around your neck right now. A yoke, for those who do not know, is a wooden or steel contraption that connects two oxen, or two mules together so they can pull stuff. Jesus has a yoke for us. He's on one side of it and invites us, invites you, to the other side of it. Now we're going to look at the Gospels and Jesus is going to give us a little more sanitized version, a more gentle story of a hola and a holaba. He gives us a simple, precise, and clear picture of a backslider and what happens. Though the story is sanitized and gentle, sort of, it still shows a hard road road that the prodigal son had to walk. So the prodigal son's story can be found in the Gospel of Luke. Let's read it, or at least a big part of it. Luke 11, 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 11 through 24. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, 
Give me the portion of goods that fall to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with a prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him to the field to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father's house and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatty calf here and kill it and let us eat and be married. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And I'm jumping to verse 30. And this is the older brother describing his younger brother, the prodigal. What he did while he was gone. It's what, what the older, older brother says to the father. But as soon as your son came. Who has devoured your livelihood with harlots. You killed the fatty calf for him. I just want to zero in on. He devoured his livelihood with the harlots. He played the whore. That's, uh, he lived a righteous, riotous life. Not righteous, riotous life. Uh, a, a life of depravity. That was the prodigal son. And the father took him back. In this story we see the son. He willfully left his father, he took his inheritance, which in this story is what God had blessed him with, and he went and squandered it on whores, and like I said, a, a bad living. It is worth repeating that this is what the heart, this is at what is at the heart of backsliding, leaving the father and pursuing the lust of the flesh and the things of this world. Ultimately, the father steps in, though the story does not say this, that his father is responsible for the famine. God so many times has said this exact thing that is something he will do and he will create if his people turn their backs on them. So the father creates a famine. This famine wasn't for the prodigal's destruction, but rather it was designed to bring him back. A true backslider who has refused to repent and return will experience this in some way. For me, it was my pursuit of the lust of my flesh and worldliness. Uh, all eventually, it turned the gravel in my mouth. Yet I felt hopeless, and I was going to continue in my sin. I sighed and groaned over my wickedness. I often, often pictured myself sitting on a backhoe in a deep hole, and I just dug it deeper. There was no way out. Another image that often come to mind is me on a boat, and in my wake, there was nothing but destruction. God didn't stop, uh, stop there with just a famine. He blew on the prodigal's accumulations in his life, his money, success, or whatever it may be, and he blew on it, and it just simply blew away. So the prodigal finds himself slopping hogs. Now, I had kinfolks that raised hogs. And we would go visit them, and as a child, I'd help them slop their hogs. And let me tell you something, hog slop, which is old food that's just decaying, it's just nasty stuff, pigs love it. This son was in a position where, uh, where that was all there was to eat. Hog slop. And that's, that's what my way of living in the pursuit of this world had turned to me. Turned into hog slop. And it was at this point in my life where the hog slop I was eating, which was the lust of my flesh and worldliness, I just wanted to vomit it all up. Plus, at the time, I was severely addicted to alcohol, waking up every morning, needing a drink, bleeding internally, and I hated my life. 
I, like the prodigal, remembered the father, and I cried out to him, and I asked him that before he kills me, make me his again. I figured I was going to die because of, of internal bleeding I was having because of the alcohol. That, in and of itself, didn't bother me. What bothered me was the eternal separation from the father, for sure. But the fear of hell wasn't enough. I was heading there at full speed and I knew it. But what I really wanted was to belong to him again. Like the prodigal, I remember what it was like to be in his house and among his people. The thing is, there was nothing I could offer him to make him accept me back. Back, I was a holobaw, worse than a holobaw. And the disgusting wretch that I was, that was all I had to offer God. And I knew if God didn't have mercy on me, I was a goner. And this was the place I found myself. Now I understand now that God was behind the scenes in all of this, bringing me exactly to this very place. He orchestrated every bit of it. He let me have my way and I got filled with my ways. It was disgusting mess that I wanted to throw up. Then he blew on my substance and poof, most of it was gone. And it was there. I've seen the writing on the wall that that total and permanent destruction was coming for me. And I couldn't stop it. And I cried out. And he heard my cry. Now you may be in a backslidden state. You may know what it is to repent and return only to fall away again. Are you that person that is sighing and groaning over, groaning, excuse me, are you that person that is sighing and groaning over your miserable state? If you are that person, there's great hope for you. Now, a backslidden person may be feeling the terror of the Lord. Now, that's a good thing. According to Scripture, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. They may have gotten that fear from, this, from some Scriptures that, that say it's too late, or at least that's what it appears that they say. To that person, I want to say something to you. I wrestled with those Scriptures too. I have come to realize that God's pattern, His way from Genesis to Revelation, is a call to repent and return. That call and that opportunity has never changed one bit in thousands of years. That is the full counsel of God. Can it ever be too late? Of course it can. Scripture is clear that there are some who fall away and never return. Now I do not believe those people concern themselves with the desires of God anymore. They may disworld their God and this world and their desires are what they're going to pursue no matter what. God is far from their thoughts. When can we know for sure it's too late to repent? Listen, when you're six feet under pushing up tulips, then it's too late. Listen, backslider who thinks it's too late for you. What makes you and your situation so special or so unique that Jesus' blood is not enough to cleanse you from sin? If Jesus prayed for those nailing him to the cross that God would forgive them, what makes you think your sin is greater than that and he can't forgive you? I want you to consider this. There isn't something I can tell you you need to do in order to be restored to a right relationship with the Father. You don't have anything God needs, and you can't do anything for God, period. We are 100% dependent on his mercy. And when we look at the Gospels, we see it as those who are sighing and groaning over, uh, excuse me, sighing and groaning over their miserable condition. It is they who He extends mercy to. If you are that person, there's great hope for you, and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Now, if you are that backslider that has repented and thrown away your idols, thrown away the idols in your heart, but you're still sighing and fearful and still feeling the chasing of the Lord and maybe to fall out from your sins, listen to what the Lord has to say for you. This is in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11 through 13. It says, Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen the hands to hang down in the feeble knees, and make straight the paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be become dislocated but rather be healed now listen cheer up brighten up pick up 
pick up your hands, pick up your knees. God will heal your backslidings. His word is faithful and true and will not fail. There is an appointed day that he has determined for you that you will once again know, to know his joy and his salvation. Look at this in Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. It says, And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you. Though you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Jump into verse 3. Therefore, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And when that happens, this is what happens. This is what's going to happen. Isaiah 12, 4. And in that day you will say, Praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his deeds among the peoples. Make mention that his name is exalted. It's going to be a wonderful day, and that day's coming for you. You hang in there. So in conclusion, I want you to lay hold of these scriptures and never let them go, because God has not abandoned you. 1 Peter Chapter 5, verse 10. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And here's one more that's just as true today as the day it was written. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, if you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. Call upon Jesus. His promise is that he will not turn you away. All right, saints, you chosen ones of God. Even if your life don't look like it, God's not going to let you go. He will have his way. He will definitely have his way. And he will do everything at his disposal to get you to return. But he's not going to make you return. So if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart.